Today, every inhabitant of this planet must contemplate the day when this planet may no longer be habitable. The weapons of war must be abolished before they abolish us. The risks inherent in disarmament pale in comparison to the risks inherent in an unlimited arms race. Kennedy began negotiations for the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty and a non-proliferation pact. He signed the Limited Test Ban Treaty with the Soviet Union in 1963, calling it a first step. Kennedy did not live to finish the job, but Lyndon Johnson picked up the baton. In 1968, he signed the diplomatic crown jewel of his presidency, the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, or NPT. President Richard Nixon later won its ratification, and in a March 1970 ceremony, he said, quote, let us trust that we, we will look back, back and say that this was one of the first and major steps in that process in which the nations of the world move from a period of confrontation to a period of negotiation and a period of lasting peace. In many ways, it was. The NPT was a bipartisan effort that produced a measurable increase in national and international security. The NPT and the test ban proved the substantive link between controlling existing nuclear arsenals and controlling the spread of nuclear weapons to other nations. A recently declassified 1958 national intelligence estimate noted the linkage. A test ban, it said, would help stop other countries from getting the bomb, but it warned the inhibiting effect of a test moratorium would be transitory unless further progress in disarmament aimed at effective controls and reduction of stockpiles were evident. Similarly, a 1961 estimate judged that 15 countries could develop nuclear weapons, but most would not do so unless, quote, it became increasingly clear that progress on international disarmament was unlikely, close quote. The NPT, the test ban, and other disarmament efforts made a difference. Taking the nonproliferation fork in the road made the United States and the world more secure. Intelligence estimates confirmed a steady decrease in the number of likely or possible new nuclear states, though as industrialized states dropped off the list, programs in developing nations began to appear. By 1970, France and China had deployed nuclear weapons, but the list had narrowed to only four or five other states of concern. Five too many, but better than 25. The diplomatic dam had held. The progress of the 1960s gave way to the nuclear ambivalence of the 1970s. Richard Nixon's agreements limiting missiles and bombers coexisted with the multiplication of warheads. Success in ending some national programs was blunted by India's 1974 nuclear test and Israel and South Africa's secret nuclear programs. Both America and the Soviet Union reverted to nuclear expansionism again in the 1980s. But Ronald Reagan's initial military buildup was replaced in his second term with unprecedented agreements to slash nuclear arsenals. Reagan came very close to realizing Truman's original disarmament vision at his summit with Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev in Iceland in 1986. His advisors held him back arguing that the Star Wars anti-missile program would work and he should not restrain it, even if it meant losing the chance to eliminate all nuclear weapons. It was terrible advice. With anti-missile systems still not working today, despite funding of $150 billion and no treaty restraints, Reykjavik was one of the most heartbreaking missed opportunities of the past few decades. For 60 years, we have followed a meandering path that has led us once again back to the brink of disaster. The United States and Russia still retain thousands of warheads on hair trigger alert. Stockpiles of weapons material in dozens of countries are insecure and could fall into the hands of terrorists. Countries such as Iran evoke their right to develop peaceful nuclear power that could have decidedly non-peaceful applications. Once again, we stand at a crucial fork in the road. But whereas our path six decades ago was circumscribed by the looming threat of Soviet power, today's political climate allows for considerably more freedom of movement. The global non-nuclear norm is stronger than ever. 
Most of the 184 non-nuclear weapon states parties to the NPT believe what the treaty says. We should eliminate nuclear weapons. 66% of the American public feel the same way. There's more good news. The world has fewer nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles than it did 15 years ago, and fewer countries have or are considering nuclear weapon programs. More and more political and military leaders recognize the limited utility of nuclear weapons. A broad consensus exists on the core elements of a comprehensive plan for nuclear security. As the Carnegie Report Universal Compliance details, many of the programs to accomplish these steps are already in place. All that's lacking is the political will to implement them. We can hearken back to the spirit and content of the early Truman proposals that coupled weapons elimination with strict, verified enforcement of nonproliferation. We can today, as Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon did, join limits on our nuclear forces with stronger limits on others. As JFK said, for a nuclear disaster, spread by wind and water and fear, could well engulf the great and the small, the rich and the poor, the committed and the uncommitted alike. Mankind must put an end to war, or war will put an end to mankind. We hope this conference, like the Carnegie Conference of 60 years ago, contributes to that noble goal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.